Here's the big question. How do you create your most authentic, successful, and fulfilling life? The Fresh Blood Podcast studies the stories of people over the age of 40 who are thriving in life, finding those core golden threads that connect the underlying successes, those universal truths. I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. Listen and learn from the stories of others to help you soar and live the life that you were meant to thrive in. Today, we are speaking with Michael Ann Volterra. Michael Ann is a money coach, writer, speaker, and leader in the field of personal finance. She has had her own practice for over 20 years working with private individuals on how to manage cash flow in an easier way. Michael Ann is co founder of Money Minder Online, where they offer subscription based spending plans designed to help people gain control of their finances. Michael Ann is an accredited financial counselor and was also faculty for the Financial Recovery Counseling Institute, where she trained money coaches around the world. She is the author of Why Women Earn Less and How to Make What You're Really Worth, as well as multiple workbooks and audios on personal finance. Her blog goes back almost 20 years, and she has written for the likes of Forbes and Credit.com. I'm really excited to learn more. Michael Ann, thank you for joining us on Fresh Blood. Please, could you tell us a little bit more about your story and how you got to where you are today? Oh my gosh. Hello from Seattle. I am so happy to be here. Yeah. So I am a money coach and, you know, a lot of people have never heard of it. I help people transform their relationship to money and people go, oh, what, what does that mean? You know, and, and. I would say, I mean, I know we'll talk about all sorts of stuff, but it really started with me transforming my own relationship to money. So the, the short story is, yeah, well, so I was finishing grad school mm-hmm. and I had a very uh, probably odd sounding degree. It was, I have a master's in consciousness studies. Oh, interesting. Right, right. It was like, well, what do you do with consciousness studies? You know, and I had an undergrad degree in economics, which might sound a little more practical. So, you know, I just... I loved the this what nowadays we call the psychology of money, right? And the emotional side of money and so many different elements to money outside of also the practical. So I met a uh, money coach by the name of Karen McCall. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do what you do. And well, first I had to transform my own relationship to money, right? Yes. So right. this is like my late 20s. And I started working with Karen McCall. She was my my very first money coach. And I mean, Julie, I think I had every typical issue that so many of your listeners have had, right? I didn't know where my money went. Mm -hmm. I had debt. I didn't have enough savings. Don't talk about retirement. That's too far away, you know, so on and so forth. But I was just sort of always stressed and anxious about money, right? I didn't, I just was almost afraid to look at it even though I was fascinated by the psychology of it, I studied it. So, well, they don't teach was, this in school. So I understand. I mm-hmm. mean, it is, it is a stressful thing. We don't, we're not taught all of the nuances of money. So, right. So true. Sense. Well, yeah. I mean, here I am with, you know, an economics major and studying money in grad school. And yet I'm a professional woman who was stressed and embarrassed about my secret credit card debt. Right. And how many people can relate to that? (laughs) Oh, please raise your hand. I know I was not the only one, you know? So it's like this secret embarrassment and shame that you're carrying around like, oh my gosh, you know? Um, So yeah, when I met Karen and she was talking about, you know, your relationship to money, not just how to budget. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it really shifted it for me. And she started talking about, well, what do you need and want? And where are you depriving yourself? And let's talk about, you know, feelings of shame that we have around money and how to shift that. And where does that come from in your money story? Right. It was, it was a deep dive. And I mean, now all these years later, I do this deep dive with, you know, with all of my clients, but you know, I, I, I was in my late twenties and it, it was a game changer for me. And so that was the beginning of my career. And I've now been a money coach for 25 years. Wow. So that changed, basically shifted all the things for you. And because it shifted so much for you, it became 
compassion and you've helped other people do the same? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been an interesting, you know, 25 years. I'm, I'm now in my, I don't can I say early fifties or mid fifties? I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's, which way do we want to, you know, yeah. I would say you know, it actually doesn't really matter. Depends on the day on how I feel, yeah. you know, um, I'll say early fifties today. How about that? You know, Perfect. but, uh, you know, I, for so many years, I mean, my personal passion has been working with women because I, I just, we are all destined to live this like wonderful, wonderful life. And yet this stress around money is such a a, a game stopper. So many people are not stepping into their best lives because they're stressed and worried about it. So, you know, for me, it wasn't just teaching people about finance because God, does that sound boring when you say it that way? Right. It, it was more about where does all of this conversation around money connect with personal growth, because I think, you know, we've all heard of Maslow's hierarchy and, you know, we're all, so many of my clients and your listeners do like so much personal growth yeah. at, at some point, if you don't address your relationship to money, it actually hurts your ability to keep growing into this wonderful, amazing woman. And at this point, most of my clients are 40 years old or older. Mm-hmm which is why I just love your podcast so much right? <laughs> because they all are coming in. They've all had really interesting lives. No one's like brand new. Right. Yes. Yeah. So we've got to start like, well, where are you and, and where do you want to go and, and go from there? And, and I get it because I've had to rebuild my own life as I know many of your guests have with, you know, with all the things that have happened to me over my life, you know, divorce, I mean, the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. What is one of the key things that you learned when you first met Karen that really helped shift things for you? Oh, so many things. Um, one of the things is I had never had anyone ask me how much money I, I wanted to make. I was like, what, 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 what do you mean? Like you just sort of take the salary that you're offered or whatever it is. It didn't, it didn't occur to me to look at how much did the life I wanted to have cost. It it was, it was like it flipped it all around for me because I, you know, I've now created a life in many ways I've only dreamed of, but I, I wouldn't have been able to, to get here if I hadn't been clear, like, well, first of all, what is that life that I want to create? Yeah, and, no. and, and, and what's it cost, you know, and, and to go from there and it's, um, it's huge. And yet so many people don't think about that in money. They're, they're certainly thinking about, well, you know, what do they spend or what do they need, but to push it to the next level of what is your ideal life, Julie? And, and how much would that cost you? Yeah. And now let's figure out how to get there. Oh, I completely agree. I think, I think the majority of people are, are walking through life very reactive to whatever's yeah. happening around them um, rather than proactive and thinking about what it is they want, because we, so many of us haven't been asked that, like you said, no one asked you that. And I think that's very common to be honest with you. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of times you just, I don't know, so much is built up around you in society as you're moving through life and there's this expectations and you're following these paths and, and you start to, or you forget to ask yourself or no one asks you, what is it that you want? And you stop to think about it. So I love that she made you think about that. And so that helped you create in your own mind of what you wanted. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the time, I, mean, I was pretty young. Um, it's funny, you don't feel young when you're out of grad school and in, in your late twenties, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I was, yes. you know, so so I, at that time in my life, like, like so many people, was just entering marriage, right? My what, what turned out to be my first marriage, but of course I didn't, I didn't know that, right? You know, so um, you know, I, I I fell in love and and wanted to start a family and all that. So a lot of those um, questions were still hugely important. What was the the life and the lifestyle that my um, then husband and I wanted to have, and you know, we wanted to have children and we wanted to move back to Seattle. I was living in San Francisco. I went to grad school um, in the Bay Area, down in the San Francisco area. And I'm born and raised in Seattle. And so to come home and to restart, not restart, but really build a private practice in Seattle, that was my dream, Mm -hmm. right? So everything I learned, I used to create 
the life that I began building in Seattle. Now, there were a lot of twists and turns. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) Tell me me a little about that because building what you built is not, I mean, this is a dream and it's a dream that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy dream. (laughs) It isn't, but it is very worthy. So tell us about your own your own story of how, how did that happen for you? I mean, cause you're in your twenties and you decide that you want to be a money coach. How did you go about right. doing that for yourself? Well, so I start, I, I trained with Karen. I did my own coaching with Karen and then she trained, I was one of the very first people that she trained to be a money coach. So I finished grad school, finished my certification in money coaching. And I started a um, I call it a baby private practice in San Francisco because we weren't quite ready to move to Seattle. So I started seeing my my you know first clients and really learned the business of money coaching and whatnot. When I moved to Seattle, uh, I basically had to build a network from scratch. You know, so I joined women business owners in Seattle, did a ton of networking, talked to anyone who would talk to me. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Nowadays, when you say money coaching, it's a little bit more familiar. Now, it's still a fairly new field. But when I was in when we moved to Seattle in, in 98, all the time I spent networking, people go, what, what, what do you do? Money coaching? What? You know, so I'd have to say, I don't do investments. I'm not an accountant. In many ways, I'm more like a financial therapist, you know, so I spent, but what it allowed me to do in those early years in Seattle was do a lot of speaking and educating people around what does it mean to transform your relationship with money? And I, because I had to have the conversation because nobody knew what money coaching was. And so that was the beginning, right? So I built a private practice with, you know, networking and I did a lot of speaking and I did a lot of writing, um, pre blog. It's pretty wild, right? You know, (laughs) I actually had ads. I'd save up my money and I'd like write up an ad. I think one of my favorite ad was something like, you know, call 1-900 for something else, call 1-800 if you need help with your money, you know, and I'd play with all these like really silly creative ads, like, you know, you think this is a taboo. What about money is a taboo? You know, so I did, did all these really silly ads that I placed in newspapers in Seattle, the small newspapers, because yeah. I couldn't afford to um, put an ad in the Seattle Times. And then I started in classes pretty much for free mm-hmm. at the community colleges on how to get a handle on Christmas spending, how to get out of credit card debt, how to budget, even though I tend to not like that word because it sounds like a diet, but yeah. you know how to get a handle on cash flow. And then one of the local television stations in Seattle was like, what, what, who is this? And what are they talking about? And so then I started guesting on King TV and Cairo TV, local TV. Yeah. And I laughed because my friends were like, oh my gosh, the phone is going to start ringing off the hook. You've been on television. Okay. No, that's the (laughs) thing you learn if you're self-employed. If you get a big promotional thing that happens, you then have to spend all your time telling everybody that you were on TV. You know this. Yeah. So, I mean, bottom line is I had to learn both my own skill and craft of really coaching people around the relationship to money with money, but I also had to learn how to be a business owner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a big deal because, you know, being self, choosing to be self-employed, choosing the self-employed life is a huge decision, you know, and I, I know that, that many women, um, end up choosing it partly because of, you know, like you've talked about in your podcast, ageism in the workplace. And and there's lots of reasons why self-employment makes sense for women so that we can set our own schedules, but you know, nobody's just handing you business. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you know, it's like, how do you handle your discomfort around for me really dealing with, uh, am I okay being visible? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's am a I okay one, right? being myself out there? How did you do that? How did you get yourself to do it? Because it isn't easy. It, it is very difficult to do to put yourself out there. Yes, so true. Uh, a lot of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> therapy, therapy works. Therapy, therapy works. Therapy, 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 therapy. Um, everyone, go out and hire the nearest psychotherapist you can. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I worked hard on, on that, but you know, the other piece is 
for me, and I, I don't think this is unusual, but the, the more visible I am, Jolie, the more I have to increase my self care. Mm. Because it just, it, it takes a lot of energy. And I know for me personally, I happen to be one of those highly sensitive people, you know, the HSPs of the world, the highly sensitive people. So I am really sensitive. And so if I'm being visible and I'm putting out like a lot of newsletters or I'm speaking, there is this fear of like, oh my gosh, what, what are they going to say? Or they're going to think I'm this, or they're going to think I'm that, you know, whatever. So the, the more visible I am, the more time I have to block out for super private me time, you know, whether it's the proverbial bubble bath. And for me, it's, you know, I've got a really deep meditation practice. I've got a, a personal writing practice that's part of my meditation practice. But I have to literally block out time that I don't see clients on days that I have a lot of outgoing marketing mm-hmm. because it just feels like this massive energy. Yeah, that I'm putting out, and I can handle it. But you have if, to be here. Yes, if I'm really, you know, it's just like it's exquisite self care because otherwise, I get, I, I just turn into a turtle. Otherwise, I want to like crawl in my shell and not come out, and that that's not really great for being a bad business yeah. owner. <laughs> Oh, I applaud you for this. It's such a, such a good message and it's important for all of us. And I think so much, so many of us that we don't do that self care and it does make such a difference. I feel you. I'm, I'm a sensitive person as well. And I, I, I completely, I'm right there with you. If there's a lot of going, like a lot of that energy going out, I too need to have that me time, that downtime in order to build myself back up again. It's, it's building that energy back up. It's like, the de- depletion needs to be restored essentially is how it feels to me. And if I yeah. don't do that, then I am just not, I, I won't be at my best. And I, I agree. And, you know, I, I, I would even um, add that, you know, when I, when I think about what are the biggest sh- things I've learned in my life that have been helpful and I, and certainly it's not just one single thing, but you know, it was after my, cause I, my divorce happened when I was, you know, 39 turning 40. Right. So for me, which is a whole other story we can hit. Cause it's like, Oh my goodness, that's huge. But for me to learn about being an HSB, highly sensitive person, I, I had never really encountered the, the term. I mean, I always knew I was sensitive, overly sensitive, too sensitive, you know, all that stuff. Right. But when I dove into Elaine Aaron's work and really learned like, no, no, this is actually a thing, (laughs) right? Being highly sensitive is a real thing that you can learn about because if you are highly sensitive, which we now know is about 15 to 20% of the population. So it's a lot, you know, we're not the majority, but it's a lot of people. Highly sensitive people are wired to be among the happiest people. If you know that you're sensitive and you know what to do to handle and take care of your sensitivity. If you don't know how to handle your sensitivity, then you're probably going to be among the unhappiest of people. And, and that was huge for me to learn about a, I'm not a weirdo. I can be a successful self-employed businesswoman and still be highly sensitive and, and B there's all these strategies that I can use to, help me be successful and, and, and happy. And so it was just such a lovely thing in my journey because it really came up a lot in my business around, about really taking care of myself so that I could then go out and be of service to people. Right. And that's so important. And really everyone has a different self-care kind of need, yet so many of us are not finding the one that's right for us. And that is right. a really important message all around. So, I mean, if you don't have a (laughs) self-care, you're not taking care of yourself. Oh, yes, everybody. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, it's it's different things that we need, but we need to to have that self-awareness and within ourselves to know when when it's missing and when we need to go find it. You know, I know, you know, like my husband, it might be, he needs to go on a bike ride, you know, (laughs) or or get out, you know, go work, do that workout. I mean, some, some people need that. It all depends on what it is that you need. But I'm, so I'm curious, so. You built your, and I loved your story of building your coach because basically what you did was, uh, it's really uh, one of those universal truths of success is you just went and you were who you wanted to be, basically. You went out there and you spoke your, your, 
your words, your thoughts, your learnings that you wanted to teach. You did it for free. You know, you became um, you became a master at your own topic and you shared and that grew your business. And really, that's what I found on so many of these stories is when you're trying to break into something that may be new, um, often just going and doing it. You don't you don't need to wait for permission. You just go do it. And then it right. Comes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it, w- it was interesting when I started teaching at the community college, these were just like the continuing ed programs. These weren't big official four credit classes. And, you know, people don't realize anybody can submit a course proposal, but we often think, oh, no, no, we have to wait until something, fill in the blank. Yes. Right. But you, you can submit to teach uh, anything you want any, anywhere you want. If you do it enough, eventually somebody's going to say yes. I didn't know that. That's a great piece of advice. That's mm-hmm. wonderful. Great avenue. So, so you build up your, your coaching practice and things start going well. And, and then you hit this, is, was the divorce the biggest challenge that came your way after your, your practice? Yeah, for going? sure. There, I would say there's two huge, huge challenges. I'll tell you the, sec- the second one in, in, in a minute, cause it's interesting. It's, they're all, we all have these interesting life stories, right? You know, but you know, for me, um, I was married. We had this beautiful son. Uh, My son was nine. I was 39. And that's when my marriage exploded, right? And it's not an uncommon story, of course, but it's always so painful when it's your story. And so I ended up taking my son and we it was so interesting with, with, you know, with my husband, I always, 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 always wanted to own a home. And he said, no, 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 we can't own a home. It was almost like this. It's not why we divorced, but it was this constant tension in our relationship. Uh, Well, we can't afford to buy a house. Oh, I think we can blah, 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 blah. Right. I'm a money coach for God's sake. So I know what we can do. So, so, but in, in the aftermath of our divorce, I ended up taking my son and moving in with my mom I, I lost everything in my divorce. I mean, I, I, I lost everything and I ended up, um, moving into literally Jolie, my high school bedroom. Like here I am, I'm now turning 40. It's not a happy 40th birthday. I am in the high school bedroom. Uh, there are shadows of Duran Duran posters around me from high school years. I mean, you know, it's just <laughs> it's like, that's not a good 40th birthday. Um, you know, the divorcee has arrived. Right. Um, and so I, I and and part of it was also like, I'm a money coach, but I've lost everything. You know, the, the, the retirement step, I mean, the, the debt, I mean, divorce is expensive. It's a mess. I mean, I'm drugged through the knot hole backwards and I'm left on the other side. I got nothing, you know? So I am, am brought down to zero, which is very humbling. And I, I, I often feel like my life started at 40, forget pre 40, because it was at 40 where it's like, okay, guess it's just me now. And this beautiful little boy I have, and by God, I want to buy a house. And you know the 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 irony is, I I have less than I had when I had married. I had no equity from any home with my ex husband, you know. Um, and it took me a year of saving, 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 doing all sorts of things in my business, you know, raising my fees, a lot of things I teach other people to do really rocking it, really like pushing it to another level, building my first earning power board, you know, the visualizations, you know, that's when I started my daily writing practice, intense goal setting. Um, And it took me, uh, took me just under 12 months to put together uh, enough money, deal with, uh, you know, the aftermath of the divorce and the debt debt and, you know, all that stuff. And I bought a house and I bought my own house one year later. <clears throat> and, you know, it really is one of the things I'm the most proud of yeah. because I, you know, I bought it all by myself, yeah, you did. brought down from nothing to, you know, buying a house in, in the Seattle market. And That's amazing. many things came out of that. And what, one of the things that, that I assess that I, I always talk with other people about is I didn't have money but I did have resources and my resources for me were my family. 
right? I mean, I had this mom, mom who's my closest friend who I could, you know, um, stay with for a year and help with childcare. I had my dad who, you know, again, I mean, I bought a fixer upper. Oh my God, did I buy a fixer upper? <laughs> Holy. <laughs> doesn't matter you bought a house in a year's worth of saving that's I, yeah, amazing I, 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 I will say this so my, my dad my resource was my dad to help me fix up the house it was a cosmetic fixer Julie yeah. cosmetic fixer well at one point when we breached structural integrity and I'm standing in the bathroom looking at a large through a big hole at my dad in the basement I was like dad I don't think this is a cosmetic fixer. <laughs> I think we've gone past cosmetics, right? But, you know, my my dad literally spent months and months and months helping me rehab this house. I would work all day and see clients. I would come home every night for, you know, six hours every night and rehab this house because it was barely habitable. Um, and we got it to this beautiful, sweet little home you know, so where cool. I, that I have today. And since then, and you did it with your dad. It, it's, it just makes me cry when I think about my, I mean, I will never forget the the day when my son was in the U-Haul and we moved in to that house. Cause it was so hard won. And just like, like my dad's love is baked into the walls of this house. Oh, so really we all special. have so many resources. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you're right. There's our resources account for everything in our lives. We need to look at all the things that we have, anything, you know, friends, family, there's, there's so many resources in our lives. And even, it, even not only friends and family, but there's organizations out there to help us for different things too. So I just want to give you a quick applaud though. Amazing. I mean, to, yeah, be able to do that a- after a year and not only just like, Oh, I saved for a year and bought a house. Like I saved for a year after I got divorced and everything was pulled out from under me yes. and I had to rebuild. Like that's really big. Yeah. I started work. from, let's just say negative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to build myself back up to, yeah. You know, and it, it is a huge source of, of, of pride, right? You know, and, and, and over the years, I have built the property out and I have created rental income and I've built a rental home on the property. I mean, you know, so it, it, I had a, a vision yeah. that I continued to build out that, that also became part of my story over the years, but you have to get there, yeah. right? You have mm-hmm. to be willing to vision and work and swing a hammer. Oh, I just particularly love that your husband said that it could not be done and you just weren't ready and you couldn't do this. And you did it within a year after him. <laughs> I know. Oh, I and I, I did it on less than half of what we <laughs> You just need to listen to yourself. Whatever your internal self is telling you, there's a reason. <laughs> as long as it's positive people, as long as it's positive. If it's negative, that's that's not your internal self. Yeah. That's someone oh, else's voice. All good. Yeah, it's all good. And I wish him well. And he's gone on to have his own lovely, happy life. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't ever want to regret the chapters of my life. No. Right. I mean, I, I I had a great chapter with my, my first husband. There were a lot of good, happy years. You know, it's a chapter and life is lived in chapters. A hundred percent. And that's the way we need to look at it. You know, when, when something ends, it's not the ending. It's the ending of a chapter and you're just beginning a new chapter. Right. I remember in the middle of my divorce stuff, a friend of mine uh, was listening to me at a party talk about it. And I'll never forget when she said to me, she said, you know, Michael, and it sounds like your marriage is complete. And I went, huh. it was such a neutral to positive spin. Everyone kept saying, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry about your divorce. I'm so sorry. You know, it, it was, it just, it totally reframed it for me. I'm like, yeah, it's powerful. we're complete. I really, really, I mean, that's very powerful. I love when people do that, you know, they just give a quick, say it was something and it, all of a sudden everything shifts. It, it was a huge moment of shift. It was healing, you know, and it let me frame it and, you know, blessings to that, that chapter. Yes. And here we are. Yeah, in, and it is all about the frame, isn't it? And we get to choose yeah. that frame. That's the, that's the good reminder. <laughs> yeah, and I and I personally love that the chapter metaphor because you know I've had chapters in my business. I've had, you know, I mean, chapters. Yeah, you you chapters. mentioned another challenge that you said was interesting. What was that other challenge? 
Oh, 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 oh my gosh. Yeah. So um, after, so I've been in business 25 years as, as a money coach. And so Karen McCall, who was my original money coach, became my mentor, my friend, my colleague, you know, we're still very close to this day. Well, in 2011, 2012, 2013, we co-founded a software company called Money Minder Online, the one that you mentioned in the intro. And it was based off of a spending plan process methodology that Karen had pioneered for years that I just love, love, love about how to look at your money. It, it's so much better than budgeting. It's you know, how to do a, a forward-looking spending plan to give you the life that you want, et cetera, et cetera. It's just fabulous. So we co-founded a software company called MoneyMinder Online. And, you know, it it was great until it wasn't. Because what I realized through the journey is here I am, a money coach by day, and Karen and I are running a software company by night. Meaning I it was some of the hardest and most stressful years of, of my life, to be honest, it was after my divorce. Um, I, my friends still laugh to this day because I'm not even super great with, with technology. You know, they'll, they'll tease me like, Oh, how do you want to know how Dropbox works? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, Oh, you're running a software company. But I mean, I know the process and the methodology and the software, you know, like the back of my hand. Right. But and Karen's amazing. I mean, she's just this brilliant woman to this day. She's just amazing. And what I got clear in about 2014, 2015 is I wanted out. I didn't want to keep running the software company. I wanted to go back to being a uh, pure money coach. I didn't want to continue being involved in the software company. But, but it was hard because, as is true for many of us, and I think sometimes more for women, um, I was so close to Karen, you know, she not only was my business partner, she was one of my best friends. We were, I mean, you know, we were so close and I felt like I was letting her down to say, I wanted to leave the active management of uh, the software company, but uh, my stress was so high and my unhappiness was growing and growing and growing. And it's hard. It's, we get clouded, I think, by all of these relationships because I didn't want to let her down. And I was losing sight of the fact that, well, actually, where's Michael Ann? You know, where, where's my happiness? And what, what do I want to do with my life? And I had to get clear that I didn't want to keep running the, the software company, right? And so when I got clear on it, I went to Karen and said, okay, you know, here's where I am. Um, you know, I want to leave. And I think there's a part who's like, oh no, she's going to be mad. She's going to be, you know, I mean, we don't say these things in our professional world, but internally, these are hard discussions. You're like, oh my God, I think I'm about to have a business divorce. You know, I just, you know, I just, yeah. I was like, this is my business partner. I mean, it's right? a big deal with your best friend. It's a big deal with your business partner. You combine them, it's, it's a really big deal. Yeah. It's, it's huge to, 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 shift a business partnership. It's, it's scary. I mean, it just hits on everything. Right. Yeah. You know, and again, it was only a couple of years after my uh, divorce from my yeah. husband. So, you know, and, and, you know, Karen has always said, you know, if something's not working for one person. It's probably not working for the other person in that as she and I processed and looked at it, it made sense for both of us. It ended up being a huge blessing in many ways for her as well. So that I did leave money minder online she continued running it without me. It was fine. Guess what? The world does not begin and end with Michael Land being involved. It's like somehow I thought the world would fall apart. No, the world continued without me at the helm, right? Um, and then what Karen ended up doing is closing MoneyMinder online and relaunching um, new spending plan software called MoneyGrit.com. Um, and, and it's beautiful software. I love it. It's Karen's. I recommend it all over the world. I use it with all of my clients. And it was part of the journey, right? I mean, it was part of it was it was part of the whole thing. But you know, we had to kind of work through the dissolving of that business partnership for that new piece to come forth and and be born, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
and and now I'm so happy for her. You know, I mean, Money Grit is like I said, it's used all over the world. It's 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 amazing software, um, and I am doing what I love. Yes, I'm happy I for you too. Use, yeah, I use the process that I I don't tell anyone anything I don't do myself. Yeah, right. So I use this process to guide my life forward, and it's it's such a good thing. Yes, I want to applaud you for that too because look, there is a very short amount of time that we are on this earth and to be spending it doing something that you really don't want to be doing. It's just not worth it. I I myself spent five years doing something that I did not want to be doing as well. And as soon as I was able to let go of that, it was, it like, Oh, it just opened up all, all of the room for all the things that I want to be doing just made life so much better in every single way. So yes, it's hard in those moments, especially when you've built something with someone, uh, you've put so much time and energy into it. And you're like, oh, how do I walk away from this when, you know, I've done all of this and Uh I've given up all of this or, you know, I put all and I have this great person. But if you're unhappy, if you do not want to be doing it, you need to get out. So. It's so true, you know, and, and it, as Karen and I have talked about it over the years, we're so sensitive to each other, you know, she would want to do things that were, you know, good for me, but may not be good for her. I'd want to do things that are good for her that may not be good for me, you know, so it, it was a great thing to untangle. I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking with a, a therapist about it, really kind of untangling this, my own thoughts and feelings and just getting clear about where do I want to go in my life? And is it, is it okay to, to fundamentally go after what I want for me? And in many ways I, I simplified, you know, because now all I do is money coaching and, you know, leading women through this process so that they can create the life that they want using money as the sacred tool. And isn't life lovely when you have that level of clarity and, and, and you're so focused. Yes. <laughs> you figure out what you want and you go, you go do exactly that. You got exactly. rid of all the things. Yeah, you let everything else go. Got rid right? of all the things you weren't enjoying. <laughs> right. Focusing and on the ones that you are. keep turning if you are not involved in everything else, yes. right? <laughs> yes. No, really, yeah. really good lessons from your challenges. I, I'm curious, yeah. um, before we get into your successes, I'm curious, what is your personal definition of success? And based on that, what do you think is imperative for having continued success throughout life? Oh, there's a small question. What would be my definition of, of, um, success? I believe that success is about stepping into your owning your happiness and owning your power. I am successful when I am stepping into my own power. I'm stepping into my own happiness and claiming it. To me, that's success. When I can claim my happiness and I can claim my power, it's um, that might, maybe that sounds a little too like mushy, it. but there's just something in that about claiming happiness. I have a right to be happy and I am going to name it and I'm going to frame it out and I'm going to go there and I'm going to grab that happiness for me. And I, and I get a habit. I deserve to be happy. That's to me is, is success. And it's, it's going to be different for all of us. It may or may not involve lots of money, but you know, you want to claim for you what makes you happy and go there. Mm, It's powerful. I completely agree. I'm curious. So, I mean, you've done a lot and we've talked about some really big successes. So it might, you might've already talked about it, but what would you say is one of your greatest successes in life and, and why? Um. Well, it was a huge success to buy, to buy that house. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You know, I I I do consider co-founding MoneyMinder Online with with um, Karen back in 2013 a big success. I consider it a big success to shift to the next chapter away from it. You know, writing my book was a success. I'm excited to write the next book, which will probably be something called you know of of Tango Love and Money. You know, just because I'm I've you know, I'm a, I'm a dancer by night. So that's what I truly, 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 I would talk about that. That's super fun. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, there've been a lot of lovely successes. The more that I have clarified who I am and what I want to bring to the world, the more successful that I am not getting distracted by almost all these side 
things because there's you know there's so much that we could all teach and offer to the world but to to almost double down on who I am I I want to be I want to be able to teach people all the process that I have used to create the life that I love we're all going to create a different and interesting creative life right but you know I've got the process and methodology to do it and you know it's it's so wonderful to be able to be living proof of that, even though my own story has been full of twists and turns around, around money. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, I lost so much in my divorce. I mean, you know, again, anyone who says that, that they've never had, you know, money downs, it's like, come on. I, you know, I love to say broke is temporary, poor is eternal. Meaning we all go through times when we don't have a lot of money. Yes. It, it's temporary. Yes. It's temporary. You know, poor is a state of mind. I completely agree. I love this so much. Right? So yes. It's like you want to know and feel you are true abundance because abundance is more defined as an internal state. We get confused and think it's about the external state. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. You know, um, tell us a little bit about your book because it's an, I mean, your book is a wonderful topic and, and really hits home for a lot of women, why women earn less. What is something in your book that you could share that might listeners might find very helpful? So the, the, this, this particular book, the one that I already published that one. So it is very much on uh, why do women undersell themselves? And more importantly, how do we not do that? Right. So it, it talks a lot about that when I wrote it, the term under earning was not very commonly heard. It's a little bit more heard now, but under earning is defined as the pattern of earning below your potential. So it's not about, oh, oh I didn't make a lot of money because my boss wouldn't promote me or, you know, everyone has something that happens. Right. But when we have this pattern of consistently underselling ourselves, that says that there's something else going on. And so when, one thing that's really helpful is simply naming it. A lot of people need to stop and go, wait, you're right. I am the common denominator. Like there is a pattern of me accepting less money than potentially the other people around me. And you know, we could get caught up in talking about the wage gap and, and women, particularly um, women in age, is ageism in the workplace is, a, oh my goodness, that's a big topic. Um, but what, what we know is there's this other piece where women often tend to accept less money than the people around them and they don't know it. They don't necessarily know it's it, conscious, right? Like, right? Oh, Right, right, right. So like I'll tell you just one, one quick study just to kind of dri- drive it home for your listeners. They do these studies all the time called pay equity studies where, and they, you know, we're always experimenting on university students because they're so plentiful at the university. <laughs> so the researchers bring them in, young men and women, and they give them a job. Doesn't matter what the job is. Go weed the garden, go mentor undergrad students in essays and help them in math, whatever. Okay, so go do this job. And they come back from having done this task and the young men and women are asked to self-evaluate, how well did you do the job? Okay, so the good news, Jolie, is that women don't self-evaluate less than men. We know we do a good job. We give ourselves just as high a score as men do in terms of how good we are at our work. Not the issue, okay? So, but here's where it's interesting. The researchers say, you know... Next, we need more help. And next time we want to pay you, um, would you write down for us secretly on this piece of paper? Would you write down for us how much um, you'd like us to pay you next time we need this job done? Well, you know where this is going, right? So so they collect all this this data from these young men and women. And, and all the young guys will write down, yeah, I'd do it for you for about, about $100 you know, and all the young women write down, yeah, I do this for you for about 70. And they do this type of study again and again and again and again and again. And they always find that, that on average, women are, are giving these numbers that are significantly lower than the young men around them. They don't know they're doing it. The young men don't know they're doing it. The young women don't know they're doing it. Right. And it begs a lot of questions of where's this, coming from. And if we had another five hours, 
<laughs> but, um, but I will say to your question, what can help your listeners, yeah. right? Is if you research what the job should pay, that is going to be a huge piece that's going to help you. And it's changing. Young women are, are sharing a lot of uh, uh, information, way more so than you would have seen 20 years ago on, on like what their salary information is. And if you talk to your five closest women friends and tell them what you're thinking of doing and get their cheerleader support on the next time you're going to go ask for a raise or raise your fees, you are way more likely to not fall into that 30%. The 30% happens when women think about how much money they're going to ask for in a vacuum. When we don't talk to anybody, when we don't talk to our friends, when we, when we, when we don't talk to our, our, you know, our our husbands or our partners, but when we get that outside supported, people go, no, you're worth it. Jolie, ask for more. Jolie, you're worth it. Jolie, ask for this much, right? it makes a huge difference, a huge difference. And so, you know, and this is, I think, where women shine because we're really good at using our tribe, Mm -hmm. at networking, at using our girlfriends. So if we bring money into the conversation around cocktail hour, um, we're going to benefit. Yes, that's not going to make more money. Not very often. Really good point. Bring the money into the conversation with your girlfriends. I'm going to do this. It, it's a big deal. I mean, I, it, it doesn't sound like it, but next time you're having cocktails and, and you start talking about, hey, guys, I think I'd like to make more money. What do you guys think? Oh, that's a big conversation because your girlfriends want you to to make more. You know, and, and it's just complicated. Yes. But younger women are talking about it more and more and more freely. The conversation is changing. Right. Um, and there's a lot out there on it. But what I love is just starting to talk about it, you know, and and in terms of being a money coach, one of the things that I always add is let's get clear on how much money you need and want to make. Right. Right. That's goes back to that lovely ideal life you want. What is that cost? Let's not be afraid of looking at that number. Yes. And it's a great question to be asking. So everyone who's listening will ask themselves that and look at that and Write down the answers because there's something really amazing that happens when you write things down. It's such a, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. Now, where can people find your book? And your, I know you have video programs as well, uh, right? That, can, that people right. can find? Yeah. So it go, everything is on seattlemoneycoach.com. What I did, this, that's a website. I have clients all over the world, but Seattle Money Coach, I put together a free ebook on the seven steps to stop stressing about money. How do you stop stressing about money? And that is the gift that I really want people to have. I mean, it, it covers so much in that little tiny ebook. Um, the other thing is if people go to my blog, there's so many wonderful, free, lovely resources. You know, I just, I so want to help people. I just want people to feel freer about money and I want them to have the time and the energy to go do things outside of their work. I want to be able to protect your time. And and, in my, what I do is I want to make enough money. So I've got enough time to dance Argentine tango, right? So how do we, how do we help everyone not be stressed and create their life where they've got time for, you know, their passions, right? You know, once you're over, 40, it, it's different, right? I mean, the whole world opens up. The older you are, the more possibilities, abilities so are. It's just, it's, there's so many possibilities. I, it's so, it's so wonderful. I know not all your, not all your listeners are empty nested, but let me tell you, it's so fun to have so many opportunities to, to do so many things outside of work. You want to make sure that you've got the time and the energy and the money, and the money. to enjoy your life. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. These are really, really good messages. Now, and you are ta- are you taking new um, money coaches on? Yeah, new clients. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait, 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 what, is, what is what is this? Yeah, I I have money coaching clients. If people are curious about working with me, then all they need to do is go to my website and sign up for a, a free discovery call consult call. I talk with everyone for free just to see. 
you know, I want to hear about people. Does money coaching make sense for them and where they are in their life? If not, I help people come up with other resources or other, other referrals. I mean, who I personally love to work with, Jolie, is I love to work with women in midlife. That's my sweet spot. That's my specialty. That's my heart, right? Just, I love it. Can you share an example with us of someone that you've worked with um, that that you've helped a great deal? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, oh, it's so fun. I mean, you get it because you just work and you you know everybody's story. I'll change everybody's names, but there, there's so many, so many fun stories. You know, like I, I was working with a gal who was at um, a tech company who was so stressed about money and had some debt uh, and some net worth, but it was interesting. She wanted to work with me because she didn't want to be stressed about money anymore, but she also didn't want to work in technology anymore. And she was afraid that she had to make as much money as she was currently making. It was, it was almost like she felt trapped in this, you know, fairly high income job. And so she was afraid to look at money, but she was afraid to look, I mean, she's ready to look at all of it. Right. And so what we did was we said, okay, let's start looking, let's peek under the covers. Right. You know, let's look at where some of the anxiety around money comes from. And then as I taught her how to not only look at where her money was going, but where she wanted it to go, we ended up creating an annual plan to look at the life she wanted. And she went, wait a minute, I, I can, I can create that life. I don't have to stay in tech. But, you know, as long as she was afraid to look at the money, it, it's like driving, I call it money fog. Mm-hmm. You know, so many people that call me are in a money fog. And I, I, I get it. I used to be in a money fog, right? But the problem is it creates this free floating anxiety. Mm-hmm. And also it feels like we're going to hit something because we're driving around in the fog. So, you know, once you come out of the fog, suddenly all these options come out and, you know, she ended up moving to a nonprofit and doing this work that just makes her heart sing. And she saw she didn't need to make that level of money, That's right? Great. It's not everybody's story. I mean, everyone gets something different from becoming so financially clear and getting clear, but that's, it's like, what is the life that you want? Yes. And then how does money that's become amazing. a sacred tool? I, I'm, I'm very big into the spirituality of money as well, which, you know, it's probably goes way beyond what, what you <laughs> want to talk about, but you know, it's like we separate spirituality and, you know, so many deep things from money. Like it's just this weird neutral or masculine tool. And yet, you know, money is, I believe the sacred energy that we can learn to use and have nourish us. Yes, And we want to befriend money. So there's a lot of wonderful things that we can do. Yeah. I, I recently learned about the energy of Monday myself just in the past couple of years. It's not something that had topic wise had ever come into mm-hmm. my, my, <laughs> into my world. So I hadn't thought about it, but I was absolutely fascinated by it. And it was, it really impacted me because it made me realize my own energy towards money. Um, it made me look at my own beliefs towards money. Like just hidden <sighs> subconscious beliefs that I didn't realize I'd been carrying around. And one of the things that stuck with me is, is the, this man, he suggested that, um, he talked about happy money, you know, and, and that you want to have happy money in your life. So that when he suggested whenever you spend money, um, or receive money, whichever you say, arigato, arigato, (laughs) thank you. Thank you to your money. And that makes all the, makes the energy of your money happy. And I really, it's, no, I, I, I love that. It's like a receiving valve. We want to give and receive. You don't want to hold money in this tight tight fist. Yes. Right. And, you know, for some of us, it goes back to how we were raised. I do a lot of work with people's money story and our programming and our beliefs around money. And unfortunately, as, as I'm sure, you know, a lot of people are raised with their parents fighting about money and it it creates this very early belief that's almost unconscious that says money, it just causes pain. Money makes mom cry. Money is bad. Stay away from money. And we just have this sort of icky feeling almost pit in our stomach as an adult when we go to quote work on our money and so there's a lot of healing that you can do on your relationship to money so that you can let go of some of that you know icky old feelings but we've got to figure out where it comes from and once we do 
there's so much that you can let go of so that you can create this new open space because I, I do really believe money is is energy. And so we want to look at how do we create it in a, a very, very, very positive, positive headspace. Great. I'm fascinated. I, I am absolutely fascinated by what you do and I'm, I'm very interested. So if anyone's interested, we'll have all of your information. I know you let them know, but also have the information in the show notes for them to go find your website. And before you go, I'd like to ask you my final question. What are you sure of in life? <laughs> I am sure that at heart, the vast majority of people are incredibly good people are incredibly good people. Um, and I am sure that, that the key to life is love. The key to life is love. I really, really, really believe that. Oh, I agree. Thank you, Mike Land. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I love, love, love your podcast. I'm so happy to be able to talk with you today. It's just, ah, uh, there's so much wonderfulness out here for all of us women in midlife. Hooray. Right. No, it's a new, it is a new life and it's a wonderful life. And it's all about that reframe, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I say life starts at 40. That's what I say. Yeah. It's not downhill. <laughs> nope, nope. Yes, it is absolutely wonderful. New beauty. So, yeah, new you. beauty. Yeah, I did never danced before I, I started dancing Argentine tango at like 47 and I'm competing in the national tango championship next year. You right? are. That is so, amazing. Yeah, life starts. It's like, there's all these wonderful things that come into our life. Bring it on. I love it. Oh my gosh. I love that. I'm not going to lie. Argentine tango is something that's really, really interested me as well. I might go check that out myself. I think that women in midlife in some ways are open in a way they never have been, Jolie, to like, you know, different hobbies, different interests. I mean, because think back like in my 30s, oh my gosh, I was spending so much time in the mom role, right? Mm -hmm. And you just didn't have a lot of time. Right. Versus now I work with a lot of women. Like, for example, I've got a lot of, I have three different clients that ride horses, right? As a huge- I love riding horses too. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful, right? And, and none of them rode horses as much in their 30s because they were just busy with family and things like that. So, you know, midlife is just this fabulous time. And for me, I dance Argentine tango, you know? And, and, you know, like I was saying, I I had never danced in my earlier life. I mean, not not like I came to when I was 46, 47, I started dancing Argentine tango and I met my now I'm, I'm engaged my two. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. I met him in tango. And he <laughs> yeah. Woman in midlife, you know, 46, 47. I can't remember the exact thing. You know, all I knew is I wanted to finally pursue my passion, what I want to do. It's, you know, it's always about other people, other people, other people. What did I want to do? And I, I wanted to dance, right? But you yeah. get, you dance. Uh, so it I, doesn't surprise I, me that you fell in love because you know what? Oh, you, you were living your joy. You were living your joy. I bet, you know, and just gorgeous and glowing and yeah. <laughs> yeah, really doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was so happy, you know? And so, you know, and Robert had been same thing. He was divorced. And he's like, what do I want to do in midlife? And he wanted to dance, you know? And so, you know, however many years later in tango, we met each other at a tango house party. Of all things. <laughs> you know, being in singles in our late forties, early fifties, you know, whatever. Um, and we fell in love and we're going to get married. So it. it's, I just, I love it because I want people to have the freedom and not be stressed about money so that they can pursue what lights them up. Because oh, sometimes what lights you up is also not what you do during the day. It's also what do you do when you're not at work? And how do you create a life that has all of that? And you want to make sure that you've got money for your hobbies and you're not stressed so that you can enjoy all that life has to offer. I mean, nothing's better than midlife in my opinion. I love it. Thank you, Mike Land. You know what? Following your passion is for the win. And if you need to help getting that money to follow your passions, Mike Land is the woman for you. <laughs> I will get you there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been wonderful.
Thank you. I just, I love your podcast. I'm so, so jazzed for all, you know, all your episodes. They're so fun. I just, I love the whole topic, rocking it after 40. It's just awesome. So thank you for having me. Thank you. It's been great. I loved talking with Michael Ann. She shared how she had this huge life shift within herself when she experienced incredible changes after working with a money coach. This coaching had such a big impact on her life that she wanted to share that knowledge with others. Right off the bat, Michael Ann is sharing a universal truth. Find something that works for you, that lights you up in some way, and then fill yourself up with that thing until you are overflowing. Once you're overflowing, go out and share that overflow with others. This is a winning formula in life. And Mike Land admits it was not easy building the business, especially in the beginning. She not only had to try and sell her services, she had to educate people on what she was actually doing. Mike Land once again employed a winning formula. She put herself out there. She gave free classes. She gave free seminars. She gave free speeches. And she educated anyone willing to listen. She did not wait for permission or for someone to ask her for something. She just did it. You must first be what you want to become. Michael Ann, she put herself out there. She stepped into those uncomfortable situations and she kept at them until they became comfortable, which is important to remember because anything that we do that is new is going to feel uncomfortable. That's normal. This is how life works. And so many people give up when they feel that uncomfortableness, but you can make anything that feels uncomfortable, comfortable, simply by not giving up. Now, Michael Ann knew her wants, she knew her why, and she kept moving forward until she created the coaching career that worked for her. Have you ever given up on something that you wanted because you felt uncomfortable? What might have happened if you leaned into it and became comfortable with that new territory? What might happen if you try again now? And what about other people? Have you ever stopped yourself from going after what you wanted because of what somebody else said? I know I have. And it's usually done by someone that you love, someone who's trying to be well-meaning, but in reality, it is simply that person is putting their own personal traumas, their own personal stories and beliefs that have been formed by other people onto you. You are the only one who knows what is right for you. No one else. When you feel something deep in your gut, listen. Michael Ann's husband told her over and over that they were not in a position to be able to buy a house, even though she was a money coach and felt that they absolutely could buy a house. His own absence of belief got in the way of Michael Ann's dream. It was only after her divorce that she felt the freedom to listen to her own voice and work towards making that dream happen. And even though she was left in a severe financial deficit, she managed to save the money needed to buy a house within a year. Absolutely amazing. Do yourself a favor and listen to that internal voice inside. Do the thing that you've been yearning to do. Do not let others' fears or opinions stop you from doing what you know is right. When dealing with your goals, Michael Ann had great advice here. You have to visualize. You have to visualize achieving your goals. If you can see it in your head, You can hold it in your hand, but you have to work for it. You have to look at where you want to be, make a plan to get there, and then execute. 
every day, taking at least one baby step towards your goal. And you can baby step your way to any objective. Michael Ann shared another important lesson around her divorce. When her friend shared that it sounded like her marriage was not over, it was simply complete. It helped Michael Ann reframe the entire experience. She changed the words and all of a sudden the same experience went from feeling sad to feeling hopeful. She reframed the story and found herself ready for an adventure. And we can do this in every situation. You can choose how you frame your experiences. So when you are choosing the story that you are telling yourself, when you are choosing the frame that you are putting around your own personal story, be aware and ask, is that story serving you? Perhaps for you, it's simply that this particular chapter is complete and it's time to move on to the next one. Michael Ann's experience about starting the software company with her good friend and then struggling to find a way out when she found herself deeply unhappy, this really resonated with me. I too found myself in a work situation that made me deeply unhappy. I spent five years of my life investing time and energy into a family run company that I really did not want to be a part of. I kept giving my energy to this work that that I hated work that made me cranky and it made me bitter for five years. Why did I do that? Why does anyone do that? Sometimes you do this because of people that you care about. Sometimes because you invested so much money into the area, you feel that you cannot change direction. Sometimes because you invested so much time into the area that you feel like you cannot change direction. But here's the truth. You can always change your direction. In fact, you owe it to yourself to change direction when you know that something is not right. At any time, at any age. And if you are unhappy in what you are doing in any way, then it is absolutely time to change that direction. And it's okay. It is okay if you have to start all over. It is okay if time and money was spent. It is okay if it is not what other people want. What is not okay is to continue to suffer within something that you have the power to change. When a crisis took away my ability to do that job, then, and I found myself forced free of the work that I so despised, it was like a new world opened up for me. I was so much happier. As soon as that space was created, all kinds of new opportunities that I wanted to be a part of started coming my way. It was serendipitous. Not only had I eliminated that which had sucked my energy, I had created the space needed to allow myself to fill up with even more of that which made me thrive. I kept asking myself, why did I wait so long? If you are unhappy, but telling yourself that this is as good as it gets, you are lying to yourself. Eliminate the things, the people, and the places that you do not like and replace them with the things, the people, and the places that you do. Trust me, you will thank yourself. As Michael Ann shared, her definition of success is owning your happiness, owning your own power, and claiming it. Claim your happiness, claim your power, figure out what you want, and go get it. Finally, Michael Ann gave us all great advice around money. Now, I loved this. She reminded us that broke is temporary, poor is eternal. 
and people poor is absolutely a state of mind. Your abundance is an internal process. What are your personal feelings around abundance? Do you think money is hard to come by? Or is it easy to obtain? Do you think money corrupts? Or do you think it opens up opportunity? Do you think money causes problems? Do you think too much money causes distrust? Whatever it is that you think, you will be right. Take a look at your money beliefs. Are they true? Are they serving you? If not, you need to change your beliefs around money in order to change your overall money situation. Michael Ann shared that fascinating university study where the women and men, they both rated themselves equally strong for a job well done. But it was found that women asked for less than their male counterpoints regularly. So do your research. Know what people are making in your industry and in your role. Get in touch with how much money that you want to be making. Know the number you need, know the number you want, and write those answers down. Talk with friends about money. Get that support system around money. And as Mike Lynn shared, when we don't talk with others, we tend to devalue ourselves. The world does enough of that for you. You deserve to demand your value. Ask for more. You do not get what you do not ask for. So that is my wish for us all. That you get clear on what you want and what you need. And then you go out and ask for what you deserve. Until next time. Thank you for joining us on Fresh Blood. Please subscribe and follow us on all streaming services, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Player FM. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Fresh Blood Podcast. I would love your help in spreading these stories and important messages. Please give us a like and share with a friend. Your help is greatly appreciated. I hope you make today a most fulfilling day.